I also have to say, John, so thank you for being part of the symposium. And I mean, I, I'm telling you, people I have a lot of respect for you because I was told that he's like the I mean, like very respected mediator in Canada. So, I mean, it's of course wonderful to have you. And only thing that might happen is I might not let you talk about yourself first. I will want to ask you to tell us about the symposium, how what you know about the symposium, because it's something which, I mean, I will keep repeating what I understand from it, but I think there is lots that people will be able to tell me. So what would you want to tell us about the symposium? Well, this symposium is, is one of those things, I think, that bring a broad range of people together so that uh, we can help with understanding that we know that when we talk about mediation, when we talk about solving problems, there's no easy formula and there's no uh, uh, ABC. And if you follow the ABC route, things will get done. Everyone is different. And every, uh, every process that we become involved in is different. And so what this symposium is doing is bringing together a, a wide range of experiences, a wide range of people that will allow us to think and allow us to, to better that communication within our group, but within the people that we're out there mediating with. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm thinking that, uh, that this is valuable, that all the input is valuable, and, and above all, we need to have this discussion on an ongoing basis. So nice. I mean, this is exactly what I mean. If I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to put it so nicely. I'm seriously saying, actually. So, of course, thank you. And I mean, all these recordings are available on my YouTube channel. People just have to search Mediator Victim. You'll find that there are, there's a schedule out there with all the links. So that's my little introduction on the symposium now it's all yours all yours about yourself about the topic please well okay well thank you very much Vikram and it's uh, certainly a uh, an honor to be asked to be a part of this symposium and uh, and uh, and certainly you're uh, you you have uh, opened this up in a in a very nice way a very good way and that's one of the things that uh, that we as uh, Anishinaabeg people, Anishinaabeg meaning indigenous people from the area where I live, and I live on, a, on an Indian reserve, and it's called the First Nation here in Canada. And uh, uh, I, I lived in the area all my life, and, uh, and, and, and now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing many different things, including mediations. I'm, uh, I'm involved with... Uh, Renewable energy. I have, I'm involved with three companies uh, uh, that that produce renewable energy, right from the wind, the big wind turbines, down to the point where we uh, take garbage and uh, and biological garbage and we turn it into methane gas and create renewable natural gas or burn the methane to uh, to make electricity for greenhouses to grow tomatoes. So it's a, it's a wide range of things that I'm involved in, and I'm, I'm uh, uh, very, uh, very happy to, uh, to do that because uh, uh, the, the aspect of, uh, of mediations bring in the uh, interpersonal kind of things, but we also have to look at how we relate to the world. And uh, we call the world, the earth, Nishkakmakwe, which means the mother our mother, the earth. And, uh, and we have been very mean. We have been not been very nice to the mother earth. And uh, in, in so many ways that, that this, this is talking about mediation, I guess, in a, in, a, in a larger sense. How do we solve that problem with the mother earth? How do we look after those generations that will come after us so that they have a nice place to live, and uh, and we have to do it by uh, by reducing the harmful effects of climate change, by reducing uh, the carbon in footprint on the on the world, but also by uh, being able to talk to somebody else and talk to other people and other nations and so on, 
in a way that uh, that conveys understanding and conveys a way of life that looks after the mother earth and and w- when we uh, when we bring it down to a micro level you wouldn't hurt your own biological mother you you w- that's the last thing in the world that you would ever think of and uh, or your grandmother or your great grandmother or and so we have to look at it like we cannot hurt our mother who nurtures and has produced all of us. So uh, uh, that's something that is very near and dear to our traditional way of thinking. And uh, when I start talking about mediation and start talking about how we, uh, how we relate to other people, I, and, and, as, and I'm, I'm involved very heavily in mediations with uh, uh, Indigenous people here in Canada and looking after some of the, the, the harmful effects of colonization, some of the harmful effects of, uh, of residential schools, uh, uh, just all of those things that have happened in this continent for the past 500 years. And there have been some elders that have said to us, we are in the last stages of first contact. And, uh, and so we're still coming to grips with how we relate to the colonial groups that have come to this country and how we understand how we fit in to that social milieu that we have within uh, within Canada, within North America, and I'm sure within other places around the world, because colonialism isn't just here. Colonialism happened in India. Colonialism happened in Africa. Colonialism happened in the Philippines and all over. And it's just, uh, and some of these harmful effects are multi-generational. And so we are looking at how we move beyond those actual effects and now as i uh, as i as i talk about that i i remember some of the very early discussions i had with vikram just a short while ago and uh, and i was i was telling him i was going to introduce myself in the traditional way and here i go right into uh, into the discussion without introducing myself so i will provide that introduction and uh, and say oni bojo oya be in addition to cost Wasoxing Donjaba Anishinaabe Day and Dao. And uh, and that provides you within my native tongue who I am, my clan, where I live, and and my my tribal affiliation. It also gives you uh, an aspect of of uh, of how I fit into the greater world. So that's part of, of, of what we do on a regular basis. And, and, uh, and, and normally I, I don't skip by some of those uh, 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 formalities, but uh, today I'm so excited to be on this symposium that I went right by it. But anyways, pardon me for that. But uh, I wanted to get into the, some of the historical perspective here. And uh, some of it is, is how we as indigenous people relate to the earth and why that has moved forward to present day and, and, and uh, actually has caused some of the issue that we see in, in, uh, with, with regard to uh, uh, legal problems, with regard to uh, family issues, with regard to addiction issues and all kinds of things that are, are happening right now. Uh, when we were were here prior to contact, our my my uh, ancestors, we lived on the land, and we called this this Turtle Island. We called North America Turtle Island. Uh, our belief is that we lived here since time immemorial. That uh, the Creator. Uh, put us here for a purpose and every every different people have a purpose and uh, when the creator set us here on turtle island the purpose that uh, that we had was to number one 
always maintain that spiritual contact with the creator. And number two is to look after the land, is to look after Mishkak Makwe, is to look after the, uh, the ongoing health of the land and, and the trees and the water and everything else. To the point that uh, even during all of our ceremonies, uh, we, we start out by giving thanks to the creator to allow us to be here. We give tobacco to, uh, to each other so that we could burn the tobacco in a sacred fire and allow the smoke from the tobacco to carry our prayers to the creator. And, uh, and then during that ceremony, we always give time for a woman to talk about the water to give thanks for the water because the water is so integral to our, uh, to our ongoing uh, survival as a, as, as a species and all species need water. So the, there's a, there's a real, uh, 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 I guess, role requirement that uh, men look after the fire and women talk about the water and women look after the water. And so when you have the two together, you need fire to survive, you need water to survive. And so these, these elements are brought together in ceremony. And, uh, and so that's, that was something that has been going on for, for thousands of years. We also uh, were very cognizant of the way that we uh, related to the land, that, uh, that we, spoke about the spirits within the water, the spirits within the trees, the spirits within the rocks and the earth and the sky and, and, uh, and so on. Because all of these spirits had to be in balance. And if they were out of balance, then, then something was wrong with creation. And we had to take pains to bring those spirits back to balance. And now today we'd call that ecological balance, but a thousand years ago we called it spiritual balance. And then when the uh, uh, the colonialists came here and the uh, uh, the, the various uh, uh, religious elements that that came to the land, they they saw immediately that we were very spiritual people. And then when they we we talked to them about keeping the spirits in balance within the land, the rocks, the water, the earth, and so on, they thought we were talking about pantheism, that, that we were worshiping uh, the, these uh, uh, so-called spirits. And they, they didn't understand that we still believe in the one creator, but they, they, they kind of misinterpreted who we were. And because we were spiritual people, we latched on to their spiritualism as well. And so we have a, a large number of, uh, of Anishinaabe people that are, are, are very Christian. That, that, uh, but in, in being Christian and being traditional Christian or whatever other kind of uh, spirituality they've chosen to follow, uh, there's always this aspect of, of one foot on each side one foot on the Christian side, one foot on the traditional side, and trying to bring those two things together. And in many ways that, that, uh, uh, that created a problem as we move forward, because then we had a situation in the uh, late 1800s where uh, colonialism was at its strongest, that we, uh, the, the Canadian government produced what's called the Indian Act, which was an act to, uh, uh, well, if you look at it in its, in, its, in its minutest form, it's an act to get rid of Indians, because then it was only the federal government that could determine who an Indian was. It wasn't your, your family, it wasn't your tribe, it wasn't your community, it was the federal government. And the, the, the act was set up so that, that it related back to all of our treaties and the treaties, uh, which which talked about uh, the the rights of of, uh, of each person in the treaty or each group in the treaty, the crown and the First Nations, uh, 
had a clause in many treaties that if there were no Indians left, all of the land and any kind of uh, Aboriginal title to any land would revert back to the crown. So then you have the crown who determine who Indians are and, and they have a vested interest because if there are no more Indians, they, they, there is no underlying title to land. So, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a vast conflict of interest that hurts only Indians. And, and, I, and I say Indians, I'm, with, with all due respect to Vikram and all those people in India, uh, we, we have been called Indians for 500 years. And now that's why we go back to Anishinaabek uh, or uh, Haudenosaunee or Meshkigawak or, or whatever uh, is, is our name for ourselves in the various areas across the country. Um, so that uh, uh, push and pull of law that, that was in a way trying to make sure that that we were, uh, we eventually would be landless, that we eventually would be uh, gone as a people has been one of the determinants of law and, and the way that we have had a relationship with the crown for two or 300 years. And that's also one of the things that has caused some of the issue and some of the uh, conflict that we see right now. Because also in the late 1800s, we had a situation of the government coming in and taking our children, taking our children from out of their houses and taking them to a residential school to teach them basically how to become servants. They taught the, uh, the girls how to sew, how to clean, how to look after a house. They taught the boys how to, how to look after farm animals and how to be a carpenter and and these kind of things. There was nothing uh, beyond that. They were trying to teach those kids how to become servants. And, uh, and uh, because of the, uh, uh, the ability and the, uh, and, and the stubbornness of many of our uh, young people, some eventually went on to become doctors, and lawyers, and so on in, uh, as, as, they, uh, as they matured. But we also have that remnant of the Indian Act that until 1960, the Indian Act forbade us to hire a lawyer, to be a lawyer, to be a teacher, to join the army, to vote. We couldn't vote until after 1960. So that colonialist oppression has, has been around for hundreds of years, and it's only been uh, the past 50 year, 60 years that the colonialist oppression has started to release. So like I, I was born before 1960, so it's within my generation that we couldn't vote. And so we're only just starting to, to gain some of that insight, some of that that decision-making authority that we can look after our communities, that we can look after ourselves, and that we could go on to higher education to be able to, uh, to, to uh, represent our people. When I first went to university in 1970, there was uh, maybe a handful of indigenous students in universities across the country. Now there are thousands. There was only one or two indigenous lawyers, one or two indigenous doctors in Canada. Now there are hundreds, if not thousands, uh, of, of people in professional uh, uh, places that, that, uh, that are representing themselves very well and doing excellent work in the profession that they have chosen. So those residential schools were as uh, to quote a, uh, uh, a deputy minister was to take the Indian out of the child, was to, uh, to turn indigenous people into brown white people and to, uh, and to have them join what he called the body politic of Canada, 
so that we would be like anybody else, that there would be no special privileges or, uh, or uh, uh, rights to land that were always there. Because we've lived on this land for thousands and thousands of years. Our ancestors are buried in the land, form part of the land, and, and that land nurtures us to this day. And that's how we, we look at it. So many of the issues regarding lacking parenting skills, addictions, uh, having trouble with the criminal law, all stem from, I would point out to be residential schools. And that, uh, that having the children taken away and at times taken away by uniformed police officers at gunpoint, taken away from their families, uh, caused irreparable harm that, that continues to this day. And uh, uh, I still remember uh, talking to an elder uh, who went to the gates of the residential school each June waiting for his children to come out. And he would go there and wait several days and they never came out. And it wasn't until years later, he found that those children died in that school and uh, he never saw them again. And that story is repeated time and time again. And it, uh, it, it is uh, uh, one of those things that, that is so hurtful to a people so hurtful to families and so hurtful to communities that that hurt is, has, uh, has been looked after by, uh, by self-medication uh, of alcohol or drugs or, or some other kinds of addictions. And, uh, and that in turn creates legal problems. It, uh, it, it, just, it just spirals on. Uh, and I've... Uh, I've been involved with some uh, mediations where, uh, where there was wrongful death, uh, where a child uh, was, was taken in by, uh, by the Children's Aid Society, uh, t- taken from the family because the family may have been uh, alcoholic, they may have been, uh, uh, have different sort of problems, and so the child was taken because of... Uh, of safety issues, and then the child is put in a in a foster home, and the child died, and so uh, you you so we think that those problems are are thirty forty years behind us, but those problems happen right today, and uh, uh, the uh, the mediation was was very uh, uh, emotional, but one the one of the things that that helped with uh, the issue there was that I was able to bring the eagle feather to the mediation. And the eagle feather is very sacred to us. And, uh, and so I was able to use that to pass it around to the people within the circle of the mediation. And, the, uh, and uh, the, I was introduced to the, to the group by the, uh, the lawyers. And uh, and I was introduced as a, as a former chief, as a former grand chief. And uh, the father of, the, of the, uh, the young girl that had passed away while in care, uh, he was sitting across from me and he said to me, uh, does your community consider you an elder? And, uh, and I said, yes, yes, they do. And he said, well, I respect you, right? I can say that right now, I respect you and we will listen to you and we will, we will speak as if we're speaking to an elder from our community. And so right there, that jumped that threshold of trust because uh, many of our people do not trust the law. They do not trust the courts. They do not trust the government. And, and they, they, there's this distrust of, of people with so-called authority. And, and it continues on to this, this very day. So when you get into a situation of a court problem or a, uh, any other 
problems with authority figures. If the people in the mediation don't have that trust that what comes out at the end of the mediation is fair and equitable, then they turn off. They won't become part of the mediation. They won't open up. They won't provide those kinds of insights and, and thoughts that can aid to solving whatever problem it might be. So in that particular instance, we had gone by the threshold of trust. And so then, then we had good discussion about why things happened. And it, was a, and it wasn't a total one-way street. It wasn't the family blaming the Children's Aid Society wholeheartedly. They also looked within themselves and, and said, you know, we've had problems as, as a family. We've had problems with addictions. And the, the taking away of this child in some ways was probably justified because the child was at risk. The child was at danger with us. But then we, we allowed her to go where there was other danger and, and she didn't survive that other danger. So what do we do? And so that was part of that overall discussion, which was difficult. It was a difficult discussion, but then also by the family admitting some, some of their own issues and weaknesses, that allowed the Children's Aid Society that allowed the, uh, uh, the group home executive to discuss what, what they did that went wrong, what happened on the other side. So there was a, an open discussion that, that in, involved, I guess, in some ways, bearing their souls, you know, uh, uh, opening the door to, uh, uh, to, to what really happened. And, and because the mediation, uh, we, we still had a mediation agreement, everything was still uh, uh, without prejudice so that things said within the mediation stayed there. It was never, you know, you couldn't discuss it outside of it. So, so there, there was this very frank discussion that, that went on that, that really helped to bring us to a successful conclusion. And, uh, and it took it took all of a day, and and the the solution did come about in an organic sort of way. It just it just happened, and uh, and and by the time we finished, we all agreed to it, and uh, it, there was a sign offs. But then we had the uh, uh, a, a, a traditional way of of finishing it, and and we used the eagle feather. We used the traditional methods of, of uh, understanding that there was an agreement. And part of that is the, uh, every time I start a mediation, I start it with a prayer. And that is to invoke our creator to sit amongst us, to listen, to listen to the truth of the words that are spoken by each person around the room. And to uh, uh, not necessarily judge but just so that every person knows that the creator there is listening to them. And when they speak from their heart, when the others open their ears to listen to what is being said, then there's this, this uh, understanding. And so uh, uh, that kind of goes beyond um, uh, swearing on a Bible. It does go beyond uh, just just the uh, some of the, the uh, I guess the things that we have within the court system that that may or may not be artificial. We know that people lie on the stand. We know that people can lie to your face to make themselves look better. It's much more difficult in the circle to uh, to express something that's untrue, and so people understand that. And then when we finished. We, uh, we had a, a pipe ceremony, and that was that uh, uh, I, I carry a pipe, and so I, I, uh, I did the appropriate uh, 
protocols to light the pipe and to say the prayers and to allow the smoke to carry our prayers to the creator. Each in turn, each person around the circle either touched the stem of the pipe or took a, uh, a, a little bit of tobacco and uh, smoke into their mouth and, and blew it out to allow the, the, to be part of that ceremony. And so uh, that, that was sort of the tie up that was tying that, that, uh, that agreement. It, it actually meant more than the signature on a piece of paper. It was, it was uh, bringing the creator to be a part of the ceremony. The, the creator bore witness to, the, uh, to the, the, the words that were spoken and to the agreement that was made. And uh, this has happened in a, in a number of, of cases. Um, I uh, I remember uh, a few years back being involved with a with a very uh, complex mediation involving a number of uh, uh, parties. There was probably uh, eleven or twelve parties around the room, each representing a community. And uh, uh, the the dispute between them had been going on for twenty years that they met once or twice a month for 20 years to come to an agreement on, on treaty, to come to agreement on land, to come to an agreement on disposition of, of vast amounts of, of resources, including uh, uh, money, a lot of money. And, uh, and so they couldn't come to an agreement. They, uh, uh, it, it just seemed like as soon as you got one thing solved, two things would, would pro come up. And so uh, everybody would go back to their community. They would talk to their elders and talk to their community members, and they would come back with, uh, with their position. And, uh, and they would, the, the representatives who were at the, at the uh, discussion would be very vocal, would be uh, often stubborn, often try to work out the, what the problems were, but it just seemed like it just never happened. So, so myself and two other mediators went in and, uh, and we talked to them. One of the, uh, the things I did at that time was uh, uh, some of the, uh, the community the communities that were there had been uh, uh, dispossessed of their cultural and traditional teachings for a couple of generations. And, uh, and that was because of the colonialist aspect of things that they were scattered to the wind when they were take, were th basically thrown off their land. And there was no treaty in that area. So they were uh, dispossessed. They, uh, they didn't understand some of their traditions and some of their culture. So the first thing I did was I spent the whole afternoon talking to them about the creation story and how we became the Anishinaabek and how the, the creators put us on this earth and how the creator gave us responsibilities on the earth. So that's how we started. And then the next thing we did was um, we listened to them. They, 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 uh, did a, a discussion, a, dis, a discussion, and they were in a, a room like a classroom. They had all tables and so on, all set up. And, and uh, we listened to them and their, their issues. So we agreed that myself and one of the other mediators would go to their community one by one and talk to the representatives with their elders and other community people there to really find out what what they were thinking because the the community would say this to their representative and the representative would come there and 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 uh and give his his or her uh opinion and and this is where we are and i'm not moving but yet there were things i think that that were unsaid there were there were uh when when you get to the community itself there were uh uh, 
opinions, there were underlying uh, ideas that were not part of the dis overall discussion. But when uh, we went to each community, in a couple of communities, we had the discussion around a fire, a circle around a, uh, a sacred fire, put tobacco in it, and, and we would listen to, uh, to the community members. And there we got a real, uh, I guess, ground root understanding of what the community was, was trying to say to us, what the community was, was moving toward what their thoughts, what their fears were, what their hopes were, and where they would like this process to end up. So we use that to go back to the greater group. And this was after a couple of weeks of being out in each community. We went back to the greater group. Then we said we would like to move away from that place that you've been sitting at for the past 20 years, because it, it, it has this aura of conflict. There's a, uh, uh, something within the room that is not helping solve the problem. The other thing was, is that every person sat at the same spot for 20 years. Therefore, their, uh, their ingrained, uh, uh, ideas or ingrained concepts were linked to the place that they were sitting in. The other thing is that the, I, if I go into a room, I want to sit beside somebody that, that I know. I want to sit beside somebody that, uh, that shares some of the same ideas I do. So that's what was happening as well. If I was uh, 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 not liking something in the agreement, I sat beside people who didn't like the same things so that they would prop me up. And that's also what was happening. So what we did was we went into a circle and we changed the seating arrangement. We moved away from that room. And, uh, and so uh, we, we tried to put the whole thing into a different kind of balance. And, and as you recall, some of my earlier statements about balance. We also look at not only the spiritual balance of the earth, but we look at the balance within the person, that you have a, a, a spiritual self, you have a physical self, you have an intellectual self, and you, and you have a, 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 a gee, there's four, four parts of it. I'm just trying to think of the, the final one here right now. It's, a, it's a, see, spiritual, intellectual, uh, physical, and emotion. And so those four elements within yourself should be at balance. If, you're, if your uh, spiritual self is, is, is not being looked after and the other three parts of, of you are being looked after, you're out of balance and something and things don't work right. And that goes to the same with a community. It goes to the same with a family and nation. You need to have balance in all of these four parts of yourself. And so we saw that that balance was not being maintained. So we tried to, to you know, put weight on the other side of the, uh, of, of the, uh, of the wheel to, uh, to balance things off. And so that's what we tried to do within the circle is to, uh, is to create this, uh, this balance because everybody was working hard intellectually. They were working hard uh, physically, but then their spiritual and emotional selves were, were, uh, were off kilter. And, uh, and one of the people in the room, after we were doing that for a couple of days, said, you know, we're making good headway, but you know, we haven't been able to cry yet and that was that emotional self that uh, uh, that wasn't being attended to that there were things within the circle that weren't being spoken about that uh, that some of the people had to talk about how they they and their parents and maybe their grandparents spent their whole life knowing 
that they were part of this community, but they were shunned. They were left out of the community and, and they, they kept some of their uh, traditional and cultural norms within the family, but they were afraid to let it out. They were afraid to let it be known that they were part of this overall indigenous community because there was no benefit to it. As a matter of fact, it was probably a negative side and there's a downside to it. So they didn't want their children to be unnecessarily hurt. So it was kept in, it was, it was uh, focused inward. And then that's also part of the, uh, the, the cultural side of them that was never allowed to flourish and then hurt their emotions. It hurt their spiritual selves. And so you, uh, you have all of this balance that, that, uh, that is out of kilter. And so uh, we worked very hard with, with that uh, group and we were successful at coming to an agreement within six weeks. And uh, uh, it took an enormous amounts of energy from all of the group involved. And, uh, and so success was achieved. Then uh, that that group uh, uh, changed. They had the elections, and uh, and a number of the uh, the group changed to the point that people ran elections on disputing what was done by the group previous to them. That it was no good, and so uh, uh, they a, a few years after we had the uh, the the problem solved, that problem solved, the new problem came up, that new members to the overall group disputed everything and, uh, and uh, uh, repudiated the agreement that was done. So this past year, I had to start all over again. And uh, I went to the group and, and started the whole process over again. And, uh, but I, I did it a little differently this time. I, uh, I really worked hard at uh, at the uh, at the spiritual self and the uh, cultural self that they were uh, that they were missing. That we would start out each day with a prayer, and then I would have a teaching of uh, of one kind or another. Uh, for instance, one person in the room, his name was Hunter, and, uh, and that was his last name. And so I spoke about uh, the Anishinaabe word for hunter, which is the and, uh, and so I would go on about how his family probably were hunters and, and it eventually that, that the word was anglicized. And so he was christened with the, the surname hunter and, uh, and, and how that, that sort of, uh, it, it's a good strong name but it, it's a, it derogates, it demeans his Anishinaabe roots because it's Dewinjigay. It's not really Hunter. And Dewinjigay has a, has a stronger, more lasting meaning to him and his family. So it, uh, and so that's the kind of, and so I, I each day I, or each time I met with them, I would, I would provide a uh, Anishinaabe word that, uh, that was meaningful to the process and talk about that. And then uh, the first few times that, uh, that we met this year, uh, there was suspicion, there was anger, there was, uh, uh, there, there, there was all kinds of emotions displayed, but negative sort of emotions. And we, we did work those things out to the point that after a couple of weeks, we had uh, laughter in the room more often than not that we would uh, uh, after the session was over we would go and have a meal together and there would be laughter around the table during the meal and so part of the mediation process isn't just discussing the problem part of it is looking after the person looking after that balance because the balance is so important to moving toward getting that uh, resolution, and uh, and I I think that 
that is often missed with what we would call the traditional form of mediation here in Canada, where you would have uh, the mediation briefs. You would uh, have the lawyers on this side, the lawyers on that side, and this side gives their brief and that side gives their brief. And you, you discuss how some, they're not far apart, that there's some interests that are, that are overlapping. And then they would go into their caucus rooms and you try to bring them together and, and, uh, it, it's it's very mechanical, and uh, and oftentimes, well, it, it it works in many instances, but oftentimes you have to delve a little deeper, and uh, and assist in the understanding of how that that really works. Um, I was uh, I was involved in a uh, a mediation in uh, northern Canada, where. Uh, uh, it was on child and family service issues, children at large and children uh, that were being taken, uh, still to this day being taken by non-native uh, uh, child and family services groups. And, and there was a, an effort to move toward having indigenous child welfare. And uh, uh, we were talking, talking to uh, to some elders about this uh, this issue and how we could solve it and one of the elders uh, brought forward this this uh, this concept this metaphorical discussion about uh, dealing with the crown dealing with the government that uh, uh, in 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 uh, in a, and it was related to child and family and about parenting and and so on. And he uh, he said basically what what we are are families and individuals, and we're put in canoes. We're put in canoes on this river, and this river runs very fast, but we're not given any paddles, and therefore we have to rely on the current of the water, current of the river to take us wherever. And we have no control on where we go. And then uh, we have these people from the government on the side of the river who are shouting instructions, go this way, go that way, do this, do that. But they're not part of the real solution. They're just shouting instructions at us. And then ahead of us is a series of rapids, fast water and rocks and, uh, and problems. And our canoes are heading toward those rapids. And then next thing you know, our canoes are crashing over the rapids and we're, we're, uh, we're, we're in trouble. Some of us don't make it. And then there's all these government people at the bottom of the rapids and they're throwing us life jackets grab this, grab this, we'll help you, we'll help you. But the real help was way up the river, giving them paddles, giving them control, allowing them, the people in those canoes, to make their own way, to have the tools available to not get into that dangerous circumstance. And that's the whole thing about the, the parenting to have the tools because parenting skills were taken away from us when those children went to residential schools. Some of them never saw parents their whole lives. So how did they know how to parent? And so that continues to this day. And we, uh, First Nation Indigenous people in Canada have about, uh, we, uh, we only represent uh, less than 10% of the total population. But we have more than 30% of the children in care in child and welfare services are indigenous. More than 30%. We, and using those same numbers, the, the number of indigenous people in jail, in prisons, are more than 30%. The number of people that die from uh, overdoses and addictions and that 
are far overrepresented. I don't know the exact number, but are far overrepresented than the uh, than the population. So those those kind of numbers are are uh, uh, they're not an anomaly. There's a there's a very strict cause causal effect relationship between the residential schools, between colonialism, back to where we are now. So when we get into situations where we're trying to solve problems, we have to understand that. We have to listen. We have to understand where those problems come from. And we have to try to establish that balance that balance between our emotions, between our spirituality, between our physical self, between our intellectual self. We have to understand how that all works and allow that to, to move toward having an organic solution to, to the problems that we, that we face. And it's, uh, it's not an easy thing. It's uh not something that you can just sort of write up a report and here it is and let's let's do this next time. Each and every one is different. Uh, yeah, I, I've I've got a uh, or I've I've had a situation one time where uh, and this is an interesting one where a uh, a chief of our, one of our communities was in trouble. Uh, his community called me in. Uh, saying, you know, we've got a real problem here. Uh, we, our chief has a, a, a credit card and there's uh, thousands of dollars on it that are unexplained and the chief won't explain it and he owes all that money and he refuses to pay it back or he's tried to pay it back but can't. And, uh, and so uh, I, I went in and we had an elder circle and we... Uh, we allowed the chief the time to discuss what the problem was. And so within the elder circle, the chief uh, was very open that uh, he had become addicted to phoning these, these numbers, uh, phone numbers that, that allowed him to speak to women. He had gone through a divorce and he said he was lonely. And so, he got these these numbers that, and it cost several dollars per minute to call these numbers, and so he was doing that, and uh, uh, and ran up thousands of dollars on his his credit card, the the credit card that was owned by the First Nation, and uh, and he was very honest, and uh, um, so we thanked him for his honesty, and then the the elders wanted to talk about it. And so the elders said, well, they, they, uh, they, they asked me to develop a couple of questions that they would answer. And the answer, the, the, the answer was by way of each of them got a, a, a white rock and a black rock. And, uh, and there was a big bag that I had. And so uh, uh, if the answer was yes, they would put the white rock in the bag. If the answer was no, they'd put the black rock. And the bag was big enough to could put their whole hand in and you wouldn't see what kind of rock they dropped into the bag. So the questions were, do you still maintain trust with your chief? Would you like the chief to resign? And so basically uh, what it was, was that they did not have trust in the chief and they did want the chief to resign. And so it was done by way of these white rocks and black rocks. And we opened it up before everybody and we counted the rocks. And it was, at, it was pretty much overwhelming in terms of the vote. But it was a, the, the traditional way that they did things. They didn't want anybody else to see what color rock they were doing. They, you know, they, they all spoke in turn, but they, uh, they, they wanted to observe their own cultural, traditional, normal way of doing things. And so you, as a mediator, that was, that was acceptable. You do it the way you feel comfortable, the way that you want to do it. We brought the chief back in 
and uh, gave him the results. The chief resigned the next day. And, and uh, an election, one election after that, he, uh, he ran for council, got on council. They had forgiven him enough to elect him to council because he was a smart man, very smart man. He was, I don't think he was ever trusted with a credit card again, but he was on council. And, uh, and he has performed his duties as a counselor extremely well, still there as a matter of fact. And this was like after 20 years. So it, uh, it just shows that, that that normal cultural way of doing things, a normal cultural way of making decisions, of, of uh, doing what's best for the overall community was being followed. And it was being observed and understood and accepted by all of them. So it, uh, it did what it was supposed to do and it got the results that it was, that it was supposed to get. So it, uh, it was extremely enlightening and, uh, and wonderful that we were able to get to that point. So uh, I think I'm probably uh, almost finished my, uh, my hour. I know that there's someone else coming on to, uh, to speak and I'm, and I'm hoping I can get back later to this symposium to talk about colonialism. Well, that's so, when you have to, yeah. That's when you have to be part of, yeah. Yes, so certainly uh, uh, Vikram, I, I wanna thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, I, 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 I was, I was seem to be talking endlessly, but uh, I, I do enjoy uh, some of sometimes when we have some back and forth with questions. But I know that your time this morning is very tight. No, no, we'll go, we'll go ahead. We'll, we'll tell Mr. Banchu that he, he's look, he's a very nice person. Anyways, audio is not connecting, so it's okay. <laughs> but no, no, he's a, I, I, I can call him the grand old man of mediation in India, and he's, he's a, a wonderful person. So he will now he's not going to mind, and it'll be, it'll be nice for you to meet him also. But yes. I think the, the, the important thing that you've brought out, I think, is that whole heart, soul, spirituality, which I keep talking about as an important aspect. And I had that symposium in April on heart, soul, spirituality and mediation, because I think these are things which are not discussed and we need to have to discuss them because they're a very important part of it. I mean, the, again, look, this is again part of that whole colonization concept that you bring in something which is okay maybe it is something that you feel is the way to be maybe I and mean, then you have some conviction but don't take away from a process which exists and has existed and it is what human connections are all about so you'll yes. hear me say about the humanistic approach to mediation and values based negotiation because interest based is what, what everyone talks about and that's the way it's been circulated and there is a book which i haven't read but everyone reads that book on that but i i talk about this other side which i feel we should be discussing a lot more if we have to really talk about mediation the way i look at mediation because the problem is that mediation is developing all over the world through the court system and mm. I think that's the worst thing that could have happened because finally what happens, even mediation in India also, we tell the parties that, look, this will take maybe 20 years in court and you'll have to spend so much, so settle. And that's no yeah. way to settle. I mean, I'm saying that you have to understand the other person, look at it from a maybe a community perspective. A lot of other things we have to start looking at and considering and let's not take mediation into that. Call it some other, something else or I mean, let's call our, what I call mediation something else i mean whatever way we have to connect it to people but don't take it into this way where you think that that's uh, whatever call it deal making that's not what mediation is all about so you'll hear me yeah. say this a lot of times you so you might get my wife gets tired when i this whole colonization thing i mean i speak so much about it because i feel the whole concept of dispute resolution and dispute resolution happening in courts that mm -hmm. being the only way that you, I mean, that's the way people are brought up in and that's the way they think that's the only way to resolve disputes in courts. It's that whole conditioning of the mind. People yes. don't understand that, that how important it is to undo that. And it's not going to be easy. I'm mean, telling you, it's not going to be easy. It's going to take a long time, but we have to start working towards it. So, yes, so, for sure. So that's anyway, a discussion. Thank you very much, Vikram. And uh, where I am, it's good morning. And I'm sure it's good evening and good afternoon in some other areas. So anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank there you very go. much. I mean, you, I mean, you can actually, uh, the, his, his, Mr. Banchu's audio is not connecting. So he's, he's got his video on, but we, I don't know if he has, his video is connected. 
but up till then you were please yeah, i would rather have you stay and meet him also i mean you must okay. meet him. i i uh, i do have another call shortly so i i will okay. stay as long as i can yeah but well, let me also maybe tell him i think maybe he doesn't know that his audio is not connected so maybe that could have happened but but otherwise what is there a word that you use for mediation in uh, in your in your community uh there is i'm just i'm just trying to think of it right now what it might be uh uh can't think of it right now okay. I, I, i will i will it, it's sort of stuck up here but i i will let you know what it is okay now you have to meet mr panchu mr panchu i mean i would say iabe because that's his spirit name but actually it's john dukhaj he's from canada and of course i put down there the that nation because obviously they're talking about indigenous communities and actually considering the fact that they people are sitting on their land so i think that's something which is happening a lot in canada and mr panchu like i said for me is the grand old man of mediation in india so <laughs> very nice to meet you mr panchu good evening good evening nice to meet you i wish i wore as colorful a shirt as you're wearing <laughs> thank you <laughs> well we uh, we uh, we do like our colors and and bright uh, bright patterns yes no we we you know we still continue to suffer from the brits and what they said for us <laughs> finally you comes down to the property and greatness <laughs> because i look everything comes down to the colonization part of it yes. everything comes down to that we, we had a go, i mean a large discussion on that mr panchu and look i call him i i mean they, everyone else everyone is even ken i call ken but with mr panchu it has to be mr panchu i i call you i've called you jor or yeah babe with him it's like that i mean i i have immense respect for him so the person that he is so that's um, how it is so wonderful yeah. to meet you mr pancho and thank you very much vikram i have to attend another uh, another call very shortly thank you thank you very much and please drop in for other sessions zoom link remains the same the schedule is available last okay. day of 31st on 7 o'clock india time we have a session on the learnings and key takeaways please join the session and please try and see other sessions if possible so okay great thank you very thank much you. bye